Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Monday, June the 12th, 2017. A lot to talk about today, so let's get right to it. First of all, here in the eastern Pacific, where the hurricane season continues to be rather anemic, Tropical Depression 3E moving inland now in the Gulf of Tuanapak area. Uh, a big rainmaker for the most part. Other than that, really not much of an issue, and we continue to go without anything very intense, no hurricanes. We're still a couple of weeks away from the normal first date of a hurricane forming in the eastern Pacific, so it's not quite that we are unusually slow in the east Pacific yet, but the three systems we've had uh, have all been rather feeble and no big deal with them to speak of. The upper level winds for this area, I did want to point this out, uh, our system is located right in here, and the upper level winds are just favorable enough in that green area for this to survive. Uh, but it's very, very small. And even that's good news in and of itself that it won't be a very large rainmaker for that part of Mexico. Uh, but a rainmaker nonetheless, even a tropical depression, uh, can certainly have problems associated with it. Let me change my color here to yellow. So the upper level winds you can see still moving generally against the grain, so to speak out here over the Atlantic Basin, a little area of green out here in parts of the tropics, and uh, it's still too early to look that far east, but uh, this is probably going to start to change as we begin to focus more on this area and the coming more favorable opportunity for things to get going. We'll take a look at that in more detail in a moment. The vorticity signature, I wanted to show you this too regarding our system here. In the Southeast Pacific, you can see it's very small and not extremely well organized, not a lot of energy or spin associated with it in the atmosphere. And as such, it only shows up eh, just a tiny bit of orange in there. And again, I like to look at this kind of like this is my x-ray, so to speak. I, that's how I think of it. That's my analogy. You go in, you say, oh, I've had a cough for a while. It might be bronchitis. It might, it might be pneumonia. You get a chest x-ray, and the doctor can see uh, what's going on inside, and for me, this vorticity shows me the health, and there's the analogy there, the health of how a tropical system is, and the more round and more energy, the more colors it has, which all has to do with uh, what we call the conservation of angular momentum and other physics uh, that are tough for me to explain, much less uh, you know, try to diagram here for you. Just think of it as if it's round and it's red to pink, then it's probably got a lot of punch associated with it. And that being said, you can see throughout the Atlantic Basin here, really no areas uh, showing up, just a few amorphous blobs here and there. But as the season progresses, this will probably change, and we'll look at this map a lot more. All right, so let's get into what we look at from week to week here. I did want to point out that the Southern Oscillation Index, the SOI, uh, has taken a dive lately, negative 24 today, the 90-day down to negative 2, and the 30-day is still at just 0.12. Uh, so the SOI is in a downward sort of, uh, whoops, wrong way, <laughs> in a downward, come on, Mark, uh, let's do it this way. Oh, it's just not going to work. Forget it. It's in a downward spiral. That's what I'm trying to say. But look at this. It really hasn't made that much of a difference. And this is really fascinating continuing the idea that despite what climate models such as the euro or the CFS or whatever were saying back in January or February or even as recent as March, sometimes you just got to look at the observations in front of you. And this has been a really, really good one for me. Uh, this is the subsurface plot. And you can see that despite the negative SOI, and that changes the pressure pattern in the tropical Pacific, to where you would have more westerly winds coming across the surface here uh, up to about 5,000 feet or so. And that typically helps to push this warm pool in a typically warmer western Pacific. It's an anomaly. The westerly winds, you're supposed to have easterly trades blowing across this area. And when you change the SOI like that, a negative, especially for a long duration, then you start to develop this El Nino state. And you can clearly see in uh, today's most recent update, 
It came out, I guess, last night, but the data is from June 7th. There's a little bit of a lag, but it shows. I mean, look, there's another area of cool developing. Then you have this really vast area of neutral, very little heat content overall in the eastern Pacific. And, folks, lo and behold, that equates to this. And, I mean, there it is. There's just no sign of El Nino coming uh, for the hurricane season. Uh, all this blue starting to show up now, uh, colder anomalies. Uh, even here in the Nino 3 area, just not very robust whatsoever. And at the same time, look at what's happened in the Atlantic Basin here in the main development region, all the way up through here off the coast of Spain and Portugal. And I even saw Eric Blake from the National Hurricane Center tweet about this today, that it's getting harder to ignore the signal that we have before us. And I just, you know, I'm pointing out that we have been talking about this observationally. I don't make a forecast. I'm, uh, that's not what I do. I'm more of a, an observation and a research oriented person. And I look and I see what's out there and then I can make some assumptions that we look for down the road. But we have seen this unfold before our eyes week after week since the beginning of the year. And a lot of people who were thinking that an El Nino was coming, they were basing that pretty much solely on the European, which has its strengths, but man, there's no El Nino and it's June the 12th. That's, that's all I'm going to say. In a broader perspective, the Atlantic Basin, this continues. Uh, I mean, look, we're almost there to the horseshoe shape overall. And why is that important? This is more and more in line with the sign of a warm Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. Just a fancy way of saying we are probably still in the active era of Atlantic hurricane activity. This certainly has more of that classic look to it with the colder water relative to average up here in the North Atlantic and in the subtropics here, and then the warmer water confined to where you would expect it down in the deep tropics extending through the Caribbean. And once we get into August and September, this is really going to start to matter. And furthermore, look out here across the equatorial Pacific all the way out past the date line. No areas of substantial warmth jump out whatsoever. Uh, warm neutral is what we'll call it. All right. So fascinating stuff indeed. So the Gulf of Mexico, except for this one tiny little area right up here, not far from Morgan City, uh, everything else is 80 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. What's going on up there near Morgan City? Uh, it's in the vicinity of that. I'd have to it's in there somewhere. So that's interesting, that one little purplish area. <laughs> but the rest of the Gulf, nice and warm. And uh, we'll be watching this closely uh, over the next few days, and I'll talk about why in just a moment. Off the east coast of the U.S., temperatures here also warming. You have this one uh, sort of intrusion in the Gulf Stream of 81 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 Celsius. Uh, even you folks up here off the coast of New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, uh, 16 degrees Celsius, not quite. You think about 20 Celsius is about 68 Fahrenheit. You can round it up to 70 if you want to, to uh, if you want to kid yourself, <laughs> especially when you're talking about going in the water. Uh, 16 Celsius, mm, no, no, not for me. It's coming, though. It's only June. Give it another month, and things will be much better, I am sure. Uh, so now, I also wanted to show you this. I mentioned this in a tweet over the weekend. The Saharan air layer is very important in the evolution of tropical waves, these uh, pieces of energy that come off the coast of Africa and begin their journey across as to whether or not they develop. Maybe they develop in the Pacific. Uh, maybe they develop in the Atlantic. Maybe they develop a little bit, and then they get squashed by this large area of Saharan air that comes off the continent up here in these huge bursts of easterly winds that come off, well, you have to sort of understand you can't have this, a very, very warm Atlantic relative to average uh, out here, right? So you can't have this and have a strong Saharan air layer presence at the same time. Why? Well, the strong high pressure that sits over here 
that sends these big blasts of Saharan air off also mix up the ocean out here. Uh, strong easterly winds, what we call the strong trades. If you have a strong Saharan air layer, you typically have stronger trades, more mixing, more evaporation of the surface layer, and you have all of this sort of particulate matter that gets deposited out here. Well, not so. It, it takes a while to fall out, but it's it's like a little blanket, a thin veil, and it's just enough, honest to goodness, to block out enough sunlight to keep the ocean surface from absorbing. I mean, you think about it. Every little bit helps or hurts. Either way, it depends on how you look at it, right? And so it's no surprise because we've had weaker high pressure overall in this part of the world that the trades have been slacker, right, less. And so this area has warmed at the surface. And so this, it all, it all works together, put it that way. So it's really interesting to me to see this. And yes, we will have some pretty big outbursts uh, at some point, outbreaks, I guess you'd say. An outburst is more what a, a two-year-old does, right? <laughs> but believe me, I should know. Um, but look, I mean, really no Saharan influence at all south of there. Okay, and this will wax and wane, and we'll look at this more. But as we look at it today, there you go. It's really interesting that uh, very little Saharan air layer presence at the time. All right, so we're getting some chatter that maybe something's going to develop. And uh, I alluded to that last week. And so we look at the MJO forecast updated today for the next two weeks or so out to the 26th. And the year, uh, the INSEP model, sorry, the GFS and its ensembles coming out of the null phase, which in the circle is typically little MJO activity, moving into phase one and kind of staying there overall for the next couple of weeks. Um, the European, as I mentioned last Thursday, I guess it was, sometimes it just, you know, they're, they're never going to get along, I guess, the two of these. And so it says, you know what? I'll give you some phase one, and then I'm going to move over into phase two, and then kind of head back maybe to the null phase, whatever, but fairly low amplitude. But I will say this. You remember back on my Thursday update, the amplification over here was very small. This is a little bit more, and the more amplified it is, the greater the impact, so to speak, the greater the Madden-Julian oscillation influence. And so this will be interesting to see how this manifests itself because this region all through here uh, is favorable this time of year as you can see uh, this is our June 11th through the 20th points of origin dating back a long time back to 1851 and you see some of the tracks these systems have taken over that time period uh, I guess a majority of them up into the Northeast Gulf but there's still quite a few into Mexico some into the upper Texas or central Texas coast, but more systems than uh, the Atlantic develop in the Pacific. Uh, not by too much, but enough. Uh, the bottom line is we're going to have to be watching this area, and I talked about this on Thursday, as a fairly mm, somewhat complex system sets up what we call this monsoon trough or gyre of energy down here, where you have a wind shift over a fairly large area. It's not like these tropical waves that come off. You get these inverted troughs of low pressure that move their way across the Atlantic, and sometimes these develop. You might have a stalled front that develops along the tail end of it into something, an upper level low, like what became Hurricane Joaquin in 2015. All these different seedlings, storms, tropical storms and hurricanes don't just come out of nowhere. You have to have some kind of convergence or air coming together at the lower part of the atmosphere and then upper level winds to take that air as it rises and convex as we call it and whisk it away uh, evenly and not sheared off and then you get a hurricane in some instances and we might be getting into a period where this area through here could be favored um, but we might not. <laughs> sometimes you see it on the models and sometimes you don't. So what I want to show you, this is the uh, latest run of the GFS. This is 120 hours out. And here is that setup, this sort of monsoon trough 
uh, trying to close off into a low pressure area, maybe somewhere over Central America. Some of this is the leftover energy and vorticity uh, from Tropical Depression 3E out of the Eastern Pacific, maybe. Uh, just kind of eaten up into this area, absorbed into it. And you can clearly see this counterclockwise turning in here, trying to focus in the Gulf of Honduras. Uh, this is day five in the GFS. Here is day six. And then finally by day seven, it's still kind of a mishmash uh, tangled up over Central America, the southeast Bay of Campeche. But this is a week out, and so this can change. If this energy comes farther to the north and clears the land mass, or even more to the north and west over to the southern Gulf, then it might have a better chance. The bottom line, we're looking like we're going to have a window of opportunity. Now, whether or not something takes advantage of that remains to be seen. So, we'll certainly keep watching it. And um, uh, pretty much every day this week. Uh, I won't be as detailed as I was today, but we'll take a look at some things. We'll look at vorticity signatures, and we'll, we'll try to sort of uncover this uh, like a puzzle or uh, a crime scene investigation. You're looking for clues. And in this case, we're looking for clues to see if something has the opportunity to develop. What different favorable pieces are there and what's going against them, the unfavorable pieces and, and we can look at that throughout the week ahead. All right. So that is it from me for today. Don't forget to like the video if you're watching on YouTube. That helps a lot. And I do appreciate you watching. As always, uh, the comments are fantastic. If you ever have a question, uh, please ask in the comments, and I will try to get to it either on the video discussion in the future or certainly answer you personally. And um, it's amazing, the feedback. I do appreciate it. And I want to let you know that. All right. Have a good rest of your Monday afternoon. As always, thanks for tuning in. I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.